Um, good evening, anybody, everybody. Um, so, not like a cork man to start off with an old whinge or anything like that, of course, like, but obviously coming after the uh, always electric Alton bar and, you know, to retailers, a retailer, you know what I mean, speaking directly to you, Anya. Excellent debut, by the way. That was a wonderful presentation, right? And, and even as a non-retailer, it's great to see that energy sometimes in presenters and take from it. So look, an, an employment law update, guys. I understand that it's 8 o'clock in the evening and I have my work cut out with me, but bear with me, all right? Um, because look, as the Cahirlock said at the start, you know, things like employment law, you know, they're not the, the sexiest things in the world to talk about, of course, like, but, but they're critical and they're everyday parts of your business. And you have teams, all right? And look, I'll hope to, you know, I, I'll certainly, the benefits of going last maybe is you can piggyback on certain things that the other guys would have spoke about, right? Um, but so we'll talk about things like um, embracing a positive HR culture and certainly things like retaining talent and attracting talent. But I, I'm going to start off unapologetically with some nuts and bolts because look, from an employment law point of view, a lot's changed in the last couple of years, all right? So I hope, kind of in the first part of what I'm going to go through, there might be, look, half a dozen little nuggets or half a dozen notes that you guys might, might take away from tonight and uh, to talk about. So, like, I'm just going to fire through stuff that you should already know about and stuff that should already have been changed in your practices in terms of HR or your documentation, especially kind of in the last 12 months or so. All right? And this journey starts at the very end of 2022, around Christmas time, when the government snuck in a new piece of legislation just before Christmas. All right? And the, the design of this legislation was really, you know, it's about precarious employment. It's about more vulnerable people. All right? And so some of the changes that would have been enforced on you guys since the start of last year, right? first thing is going to be probation periods. So traditionally, you guys have, might have said, in your contracts or terms of employment, the probation period is going to be of X length, but we reserve the right to extend it to X plus whatever, right? That has to be changed now. There's no extensions anymore, right? You've got to, you've got to stick to a figure, um, pick a figure, pick a figure and stick to it, all right? So traditionally, someone would say three months or probably six months, right? You've got to change your practices and ultimately um, stick to six months. The only way you can ever extend beyond six months now is in exceptional circumstances, which in reality is if someone misses a couple of months of their probation period, which you maybe they're out sick or something like that, all right? So what you have to get is your systems in order that when someone starts, you give them all of their training, you give them all of their tools, Ideally, you guys will set some reminders, maybe six weeks, two months, four months, right, to arm yourselves to make a decision at the end of the existing probation period, right? If they drift off it, or if you think they can extend it, um, it doesn't, it's not happening anymore, all right? Um, in terms of terms and conditions of employment, again, go back to what I said about this legislation was mainly around people in precarious employment, all right? You hear this phrase of zero hours contracts, and while zero hours contracts never really had a foothold in the Republic of Ireland, they were primarily kind of a UK and, and European issue, right? There still would be maybe, you guys might have this flexible contract option where you'll endeavour to give somebody a certain number of hours, but you feel that if you kind of don't necessarily commit to too much in the contract, you might have some sort of inherent ability to move it uh, up and down, all right? There's far more pressure on you to actually give more specifics now on the expected number of hours of work. Not only that, but the expected shift patterns a person might be able to work and the window of the working week when a person may be rostered. So for you guys, it would, could well be the opening hours of your store, right, would be the start and finish times within which you'll ask somebody to work. So all of this, guys, should already have been worked into your template documents since last year, all right? Um, if, if any of you have heard of the concept of this five-day statement, all right, so in terms of the written documentation you have to give to employees now, there's actually, it's a bit of a silly model, right? But there's a two, technical two-step model. Within five days of somebody starting with you, you have to give them certain core terms and conditions in writing, right? So it's like the, the mini document, right? There's like 10 nuggets, you know, such as the actual name of the employing entity, the job title, the wages, any overtime, any premium payments. There's a, there's a list of about 10 or 11 that have to be in this five-day statement, right? You then have up to 30 days to give what's technically called a main statement, all right? In reality, guys, the day someone starts with you, just give them a contract which contains everything, all right? That will take away the last 30 seconds of what I've said, all right? But there have been subtle changes to the content of that, all right? Parallel or secondary employment, 
To be fair, most of you might have part-timers who you may know might do a few hours with another employer, right? Um, in, the, in the vast majority of circumstances, you probably wouldn't have had a problem with that, unless, for example, you're a butcher in one town and you just don't want them working for the other butcher in the town, or you're a hairdresser or a shoe shop owner in a town and you just don't want them working an extra shift down the, with, with a competitor, all right? Um, you now have to be very careful in terms of restricting them from that. And again, go back to what I was saying, is this is about precarious employment. This is about kind of employers, let's say, Mary works in a certain shop, but the owner says, and you're not out to work for anybody else, Mary. That's full stop. You know, I, I, I own your employment, all right, and I get to dictate when you'll work, and I, won't, I don't want you to work for anybody else. Those days are over. You can obviously, if there's a genuine conflict of interest or commercial reasons, you can restrict in, in your contract, but you can't have a blanket ban on it. Right? And then finally, on, on this slide, right, any mandatory training that you have to give. All right? So, you know, manual handling training is one for any of you who'd have a food offering as well, things like HACCP training, right? any of you who'd have a, a backyard or anything like a forklift and, and, you know, legally required training, you have to pay for it and it has to be on your time. Okay? So that's in since, since about a year ago. All right? And then moving on to last summer and this Work-Life Balance Act that came in, to be fair, for retailers, remote working isn't the biggest of deals. You may still have a couple of people in a support office or something like that who, who may not quite be uh, shop floor employees. Um, look, this has been in the news anyway. The WRC are creating a code of practice. The Workplace Relations Commission are creating a code of practice on the right to request remote working. It's pretty much done. They just have handed it back to the legislator now to get actually put into proper language. Um, it'll be launched soon enough, and you'll see that when it comes out. You'll see it in the news. It'll be all over RT and everywhere else. All right. Um, last summer, enhanced breastfeeding rights for returning mothers were also introduced. So up to then, it was breastfeeding rights were there for a returning mother up to when the child is the age of six months. So in reality, it was negligible because most women wouldn't return to the workplace until the child is circa at that age anyway. All right. So now, if a, if a mother can come to their employer and can say, look, I'm breastfeeding, um, and that gives them up to 60 minutes a day paid break to either have a child brought into them or to allow them to leave the workplace to go and, and feed their child or express um, breast milk so that them um, um, surprisingly, I was expecting more clients to be on the phone about this. That hasn't actually had the same impact or the same level of requests, all right? Um, but again, it's something that's there now, and as employers, right, certainly you don't need to put up a big sign in your workplace saying this is in now, but obviously you need to be aware of it if someone approaches you to request it, all right? Um, Domestic violence leave, again, you might have heard about this that came in just before Christmas it was formalised. So on the government websites now, there's a draft five-page policy, another five pages to add into the likes of your employment handbook, apparently. So it's, it's, it's a, a, a policy you're supposed to have in for this. What is it? Well, look, obviously in the unfortunate event that one of your employees, that there is a situation with domestic violence, right? There's now five paid days that a person's entitled to claim, right? in order to leave their house in the morning and in essence be seen to go to work and not lose out on wages, but generally will be used perhaps for the Gardaí, perhaps for medical support, perhaps for legal advice or any other type of counselling or support that they need. All right? Obviously, discretion and confidentiality is going to be a big issue around that. All right? What employers are still coming to grips with maybe is you know, having a nominated person within the business who... Um, maybe would have the sensitivities to be able to discuss issues like that, but who would also have the seniority to be able to ensure that, you know, a roster still read as if a possibly a person was in work. There wasn't gossip went around, where's Bridie today or where's Bridie not today? And certainly when it comes to things like pay slips, that there's still this discretion as to how any type of payment for that, you clearly can't produce a pay slip which says a big, you know, fat domestic violence leave paid on it. All right? So, Employers are still coming to terms with that, but the likes of the template policy that's available um, for employers on that will, will guide you guys as you would create and customise it to yourselves. All right? um, there's still this slightly underutilised at the moment right to, create, to request flexible work for caring arrangements. All right? 
it, I will say on this one, it enshrines the employee's right to request. It doesn't mean that you have to absolutely grant every combination of roster requirements an employee will request. Right? What it means is you can't simply dismiss it out of hand anymore. You have to be seen to engage with a person, listen to what they're asking for and the reasons they're asking for it, and make a mature, logical decision on it. Right? Um, and then the medical care leave, which again is in place now, right, is for if there's an immediate medical need for someone who lives with the employee, they can, they can instead of pulling a sickie or instead of not turning up for work or going through the stress of how am I going to manage this scenario, they can now actually put a label on it and tell their employer, I'm seeking to take today as one of my five uh, medical care leave days in the year. That's unpaid, all right? So sick pay, this has been in place now a, a year and a bit, okay, so obviously you guys all know about it. And last year, um, your employees all had three days available to them, right? No waiting days from day one, and provided they may gave you guys a medical cert, um, the law states you were supposed to give them 70% of their day's pay, all right? That's now expanded to five days for this year, and it's going to seven days and 10 days over the next uh, few years. So I suppose, fine, you could say that's old news, but then there is now filtering through case law for all of these new types of, 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 uh, of legal requirements. And the first one was through there just before Christmas um, on the sick pay, right? So one of the big questions was, some of you guys may, be it informal or be it formal, you may already operate a form of sick pay scheme that was different. You may have said, some of you may be involved in the likes of grocery retail, and you could even remember the old JLC days when there was a, a sick pay scheme imposed on you, all right? So if, if you operate an existing sick pay scheme that in general terms is more advantageous to the employee than the skin and bones statutory sick pay scheme, then you don't have to pay both, all right? So the, the first decision came true was for a super value that used to be one of the old super quins. So an employee did not get any payment for the first three days, but then they had eight weeks sick pay available to them. So the employee who took the claim missed four days of work and they only paid her for day four. They did not pay her the 70% for one, two, and three. And she wasn't happy with this and decided to lodge one of the first claims under the Act. But the WRC found in favour of the employer because they basically said the scheme that was operating was on an overall basis more advantageous all right, to the, um, to the employee. All right? So I get the fact that any of you guys will have a thought through your head now, well, what about exactly what we do? So it's not a catch-all solution, but it still formulates things like all right. How long does the person have to work with you before they qualify for sick pay is one question. All right. How much sick pay is available to them? Is it five days? Is it 10 days? Is it, in this case, eight weeks? All right. What's the value of the sick pay? So is it 100%? Do you pay up to 100% of, of the day's pay or is it just 70%? All right, so there are some of the questions that will filter into whether overall you have a more advantageous um, um, sick pay scheme than the statutory one, all right? Um, so anybody with 50 plus employees, you should have already had like a whistleblowing or a protected disclosure policy in place. There have been some subtle changes to that in place since the end of last year, all right? Um, it just means you have to have more a name and a label of an internal person and an internal channel as to how, if someone wants to raise a whistleblowing issue, how they can go about it, all right? Um, the emphasis is on confidentiality. So again, that person who is nominated within that company to play that role needs to get at least, at least a rudimentary element of training here to know how to manage the responsibility that comes with receiving a protected disclosure. All right? And it also expands the legislation, this whistleblowing legislation, that it's not just employees anymore. It covers other uh, people who can be associated with an organization, volunteers, even applicants for a role who are never employed, but who might attend an interview, shareholders, board members, etc. All right? So look, guys, it's a whistle-stop tour. I get the fact I'm lashing on through this, right? but all of these headlines, if there's anything sticks with you guys, there's a lot of information obviously available on all of these things. Right? That's last year. This year, there's more to come. Obviously, like I said, sick pay has, has gone up to five days now. All right. Parents leave. So remember, right now out there, in terms of statutory leave, there's maternity leave, paternity leave, parental leave, and parents leave. All right. So parents leave 
is the, the, the most newly introduced one of those, all right? At the moment, it's seven weeks pay, and it is social welfare supported. So parental leave is not social welfare supported, it's unpaid, all right? Seven weeks parents leave is, and that's moving to nine weeks from August of this year, all right? Um, Great news on the enhanced cost on employers' fronts, like that there's pensions now coming, all right? So mandatory sick pay is being followed by pe pensions. You guys will have heard of this, this auto-enrollment, all right? So when it starts for the cohort of employees that it's relevant to, it's one and a half percent, okay? Um, goes now, will now be contributed by the employer into a pension fund, right? Over the next kind of 10, 12 years, it's gonna go up to 6%. So it starts at one and a half, it'll go to three, it'll go to four and a half, and then it will go to 6% in three year intervals, all right? Um, it's due at the moment in the autumn. Will it actually come in? It was supposed to come in last year and then it was delayed until this year. This is a beast of a thing, guys. It's, this really feeds into things like retirement ages and the affordability of the state pension and all these things, all right? It's an absolute beast of an issue. I remember when I started this lack in 2005, the then Minister Seamus Brennan was talking about shaking up the pension scheme. So it's a, obviously a big political thing to get to, all right? It's obviously a big thing for employers, but it's also a, a big sector, okay? So you're gonna have all of these providers, your Zurichs and your Irish Lifes and all these other kind of whoever's chosen to manage this fund, they're gonna be sending around a lot of information to you guys about pick us as the, as, as, as the administrator of your fund, all right? Um, I have my doubts, if I'm honest, as to whether it'll even come in in, 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 in August. I think maybe, you know, the, the, way, the way the year is going and as the weeks clip by, you're still getting closer to that and there's just so much organization needed to get this in place, but it is coming, guys, okay? So it's another factor in terms of year, you know, short to medium term cost management or cost projections. This has to be a factor in it as well, right? Look further increases to the minimum wage. Like, obviously, it went from 11.30 to 12.70 this past January, over a 12% jump, all right? The government has committed to a model of the living wage, all right? Um, there's a general election, I believe, planned for not far off this time next year. So our government has moved from, you know, 1050 to 1130 to 1270. You know, if an election still maintains its course for this time next year, do you really think a government's gonna fall at the final hurdle and spend so much time being invested in, you know, um, doing so much for the lower paid workers as a deliberate election tactic, you could argue, all right? Are they gonna fall at the final hurdle? So if nothing else changes, You'd have to expect something like the minimum wage moving to circa 14 euros kind of this in next January, all right? Um, and obviously, again, like I said, this year, the right to request remote working will finally get formalized when the code of practice is there, all right? And it will probably demand that all employers, even retailers, where 95% of the workforce are shop floor based, all right, that there will still be some form of a policy on the right to request remote working included. Because like I said, you may still have some employees um, may, may not be primarily shop floor based, or there may even be things, guys, that if you do training sessions now or something like that on site, you might be able to do them remotely so that at least a day a month can be an admin day or a, or a training day or something like that. All right. Um, so there's an expansion to the work permits system coming on soon, all right? Not huge impact on the retail trade, but the government are trying to expand it because there's so many occupations where people are struggling to find candidates to fill. Um, again, I don't think it's a huge, huge direct impact on you guys, but you know, in the exciting world that is HR and employment law, there's, there's this whole thing of who's a contractor and who's an employee, all right? So there was a recently Domino's drivers up the country, the Supreme Court of all places decided that no, they were really employees, all right? So that's gonna set the cat amongst the pigeons in certain sectors where there is this issue of, are people really contractors or self-employed people or, or are they employees? All right, any of you guys who have more than 150 employees working for you are pulled into this gender pay gap reporting world this year. So the bigger entities of more than 250 um, for the last two years have had to take a snapshot of their payroll in June and then by December translate that into a report, all right? So the gender pay gap report isn't particularly about equal pay for equal work, it's about the distribution of gender throughout the business. All right, so if you have 100 employees, and even if it's 50-50, right, if you have an all-male senior management team, you're gonna have a big gender pay gap, 
all right? Whereas if you have an equal distribution of the gender throughout each, each strata of your business, you're going to have a very small gender pay gap, all right? It's moving down eventually in the next year or two to, to companies with over 50 people, all right? So look, if, if then that does bring you into the loop on it, at least you'll have the history of a couple of years worth of reports from other businesses that you can find because this will have to be public on your website. You'll be able to find them, all right? Oh, I missed an important one, actually. So the enhanced employee re employer reporting, right? You probably have heard that from your accountants or your finance people over there, right? So look, I'm no expert on the finance side of it, but certainly we've been getting a lot of calls and, and even Gene in, uh, in Retail Excellence arranged a webinar for us with KPMG over the likes of this, all right? Certainly when Revenue mentioned gifts, for example, an Easter egg, all right? In their, in their paraphernalia, all right? So where you need to be careful, because look, vouchers and this small gift has become a big thing, where you can give up to a thousand euros. And a lot of the time, Christmas is the time where you might give a couple of hundred quid of a voucher to employees, all right? Tax free, all right? But the problem is it's up to a thousand euros, but it's only the first two gifts in the year. So if you're a decent employer and you buy everybody a, a rose on Valentine's Day and you give everybody an Easter egg, there are your two tax free gifts done. Mary gets engaged, you buy her flowers, that has to be reported now to revenue and that's one of her two gifts, all right? So if you then give a Christmas bonus of 500 quid, that now becomes taxable according to revenue, all right? So look, again, that's one of those little things that happens to impact on a lot of the clients. I would know more about it, all right? So just obviously read up on it, guys, and just be careful, right? I'm sure where there's a will, there's a way to still manage to find a way to give Easter eggs to people, all right? Um, but, but what some guys have actually done is instead of giving the bonus at Christmas, they actually delay it and they give the bonus on the 1st of January, right? Because then it's the first gift of the year. So you can give it and it's completely tax-free. And God forbid, like, you know, you mightn't, you mightn't even mind paying a bit of tax on an Easter egg compared to on a big voucher, all right? So, right, so moving on, okay, I, I'm, bear with me, guys. I'm going to stick to nuts and bolts and I'm going to stick to, because I don't know if any of you have had an inspection from the Workplace Relations Commission inspectors at all, right? But I know a lot of retailers and, and, and a lot of my clients around Cork and Wexford, especially in the last couple of months, they've got these notifications in, all right? And the biggest thing, mundane and all, is this presentation is, right? Like, you know, it's, 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 it's compliance, it's record keeping, all right? So I suppose, why do you need to have all of these, these records? Well, first of all, it's to comply with the law of the land, all right? Obviously, if you get the likes of an inspection, which can happen periodically, which is a head wreck no matter what happens, but if you have a bit more confidence, if you've studied for your leaving cert, lads, you're not as nervous as if you haven't, all right? So if you have, um, you know, good stuff in place, you shouldn't be as, as uh, nervous, okay? And obviously, if you ever do fall into uh, a disagreement or a legal dispute with an employee, it's important to have your, 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 your ducks in a row, all right? It just means you, you're, you're, you're forearmed and you're ready for whatever what might happen, all right? So the key records... All right? The five kind of pillars, right? Contracts of employment, properly organized and structured pay slips, working time records, which is probably the one where a lot of people fall down, all right? And I won't go into detail on these two, but they also exist, right? Under 18 records, all right? For any workers who are children, ultimately, all right? And work permits. Now, arguably, while I'm not going to go into detail on, on the last two, right? They're the two that will just be a prosecution straight away. Right? I was talking to an inspector for a shoe business client of mine who, who's having an case, okay, so, and he said, Tommy, sure you know yourself, if, if I find someone's in there without a valid work permit, it's an automatic prosecution. That's just the way it is. It's handed over, you know, a file is prepared from this WRC inspector for the DPP, and, and, and it's an automatic prosecution if you're illegally employing somebody. So you've got to double check your dates on work permits, and you've got to make sure they stay in date. All right? And obviously, with, with, with children with under 18s, right? you've got to make sure their working time records, their proper breaks, all right, and that they finish and you have them out of your business. Kind of, look, to be fair, not a, not a load of you guys are nighttime, of course, trade anyway, all right? But certainly if any of you have, have any late openings, they've got to be finished by kind of 10 o'clock at night uh, if they have school the next day and out of there or it'll just be an automatic prosecution, all right? So I'm going to just go into a bit more on the, all right? Like I said, the five-day statement or the main statement of terms, you have to have one for all your employees and it has to be update and compliant, right? With all of the little nicks and knacks I kind of would have gone through, gone through there, all right? 
just, just give it out straight away. Just have a system in place as part of induction, right? That uh, the first morning when, they, when you know, the, the employee comes in and you're happy to see them and they're happy to be coming to work for you, just have an organized hour where you buy them a coffee and you sit down with them and you go through some of your compliance stuff, all right? That's when, and you afterwards, you book Alf then for kind of part two of, the, of, of their training, you know? All right? Just make sure it's secured securely, guys. Try not to have it. I mean, you have GDPR considerations here as well as security considerations. Just try and make sure it's secured in a proper locked filing cabinet or it's taken away off-site to wherever you would store this stuff. All right? Um, and look, ideally, obviously, I've spoken about the nuts and bolts, the, the skin and bone legal requirements in a contract. I'm sure most of you have the concept of an employment handbook as well, right? So where the contract technical points is the heart, or the head, the handbook then becomes the heart. You know, in our business, this is how we kind of uh, do certain things. This is how you book holidays. Here's our uniform policy, right? Um, here's even an, a nod to our customer service, right? You must always, you know, as you serve customers, comply with the UR, the difference training you get, all right? Kind of, you can have any number of 40, 50, 60 clauses in there, all right, as well. Pay slips, all right? You have to give pay slips to each employee, I would have thought the majority of you can do it by email now. People will give an email and it's sent out to them, all right? Look, you just want to have clarity on the gross to net, okay? So it should state things like, you know, basic wage. It should have overtime. Um, you know, in retail, you still have a requirement for Sunday rate, guys, okay? So whatever Sunday rate you pay, it should separately be referenced, okay? You can pay Sunday rate in a cumulative rate if you pay above the minimum wage, but that has to be in the contract. So if you want to pay... 14 euros an hour and say, this includes a Sunday, Sunday rate, we don't pay separately on a Sunday, you have to, have to state that in the contract very clearly, all right? Or else you're gonna pay a certain hourly rate with maybe 10%, 20%, whatever on a Sunday. Make sure that's very clear in a, in a, in a pay slip when a person gets it. Holiday pay, SSP, sick pay, all right? All of that should be clearly visible for a period of time when a person gets their, uh, their pay slip. All right, and again, you're picturing I'm this inspector wrecking your head on a random Tuesday coming in asking about your employment records. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for your staff list and I'm going to say Alf and I'm going to say Helen. So I'm going to say Alf, I want to see Alf's contract, I want to see his pay slip for the last week of October, and I want to see his timesheet for that week. All right, and with those three records, they have to sing to each other. The contract says Alf works 30 to 40 hours a week. The contract says Alf's on 15 euros an hour and 10% premium for Sundays, all right? The timesheet then shows, okay, Alf worked 34 hours that week, including six hours on a Sunday or whatever it may be, all right? I've already in my head worked out what the payslip should say because the two other records you've given me should automatically sing already and I can construct what his payslip should say. I should see, you know, 28 normal hours, six Sunday hours, all right? tax, away we go, right? And because it's the last week of October, I'll also see a public holiday entitlement added in there, right? I'll then ask for Helen the last time she took annual leave. I'll then ask for somebody else, all right? Um, and that's the way I'll generally go about my inspection with you, all right? So working time records, okay? So look, the law says when I ask for Alf's working time records, you have, you have to be able to produce me a credible version of that. You can't produce for me the sheet that goes up behind the desk, all right, that's just taken down and thrown into a folder. To make it acceptable, it has to be either one of these, you know, um, new, like time point or Bizimply or one of these TMS style systems, right, where Alf punches in or does a thumbprint or whatever he does, right, in and out, right, or, or what's perfectly acceptable and less sophisticated is just that version of that grid roster but you just get people to sign off at the end of the week that the hours are accurate, okay? So that you're, you're then showing me that Alf has had a hand in confirming that these hours are credible and are, and are accurate, and I'm not just typing something up two minutes before the inspection to kind of to coincide with the, the, the pace that was given to him, all right? But that's the law. The law isn't, you know, if, if you say to me, oh, geez, I don't really have that, Tommy, I only have records, I'll say, well, you're in breach of the law then, right? Oh, but geez, I promise, Tommy, I don't work them, you know, to the bone at all. I, I say, I believe you, but that's not the issue. the issue. The breach is you're not able to produce me the record. It's like not having your driving license if you get stopped, right? The guard would probably believe you have a driving license, but the issue is you're supposed to have it on you, okay? That's kind of the, the concept of it, all right? Um, and again, those working time records, when they're analyzed, again, they sing back and sync back with the payslip and with the contract of employment, 
right? So what are the key points in, 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 in working time law in Ireland? So first of all, an employee can never go more than four and a half hours without a break, right? If the shift is more than six hours long, they're supposed to get a main meal break, right? Unfortunately, given that we're in a room full of retailers, right, there's this one hour rule that everyone is supposed to comply with in, in law, right? That if the shift is more than six hours and if it completely encompasses half 11 a.m. to half 2 p.m., it must be a one hour break. It's a farcical, ridiculous law. I know Jean in Retail Excellence and Duncan before her and David Fitzsimons before him have raised this at kind of government level that it's a stupid thing for our sector only. Someone can work a 10 hour shift down a coal mine and that the main meal break only has to be 30 minutes. In fact, someone can work in your shop from 12 p.m. to 9 p.m. and they do not need a 16 minute break because it doesn't fully encompass half 11 to half two. But if they work nine to half three, the law says they're supposed to get a 16 minute meal break. All right. Um, I'm working on it as best I can, okay, about it. So an employee must have 11 hours break between the end of one shift and the start of the next. All right. Um, and then that must coincide with a day off a week. So as well as that 11 hour break, you can work someone six days a week. It's not illegal, right? But they have to have one day off and that 11 hour window as well on top of it. All right. And just remember annual leave. Okay, you need to be proactive and try to encourage guys to get annual leave, all right? You need to kind of set reminders if you have the concept of a HR diary, and maybe even now, you guys should start to kind of set a date at the end of March to say, right, how is the summer looking for bookings, all right? Um, you certainly, any 2023 annual leave that would have been carried over, that should have been washed through now by the end of quarter one, all right? You can't have the scenario where people hoard up holidays, all right? And you can never pay a person cash for holidays, all right? You never pay them out. You only ever pay, pay a person annual leave on two occasions, when they book and go on holidays or when they're leaving you and they're, you're finishing up their account. All right? Um, maximum working time, again, I would hope it's not too much of an issue with anyone here. All right? It's perfectly legal to work someone 50, 60 hours a week. You just can't make a habit of it. All right? Christmas week or even the month of December, fine. All right? Once you meet the 11-hour rule every day, people can work quite a bit. Right? It's just that once their normal roster resumes and you take an average of any 17 week period, it's not over 48 work hours. All right? Probably present company excluded, I would say. All right? Fair enough. Okay. Um, okay. I, to be fair, guys, does anyone have any quick fire questions on that? I mean, I'm not going anywhere immediately afterwards, so I get the fact that it's a bombardment there, but look, so I'm happy to take any questions afterwards. All right? Um, right. Okay. You know. Moving on, okay, to more, you know, there is a war on for talent. People are struggling to find good, um, good employees, okay? Um, and I suppose I'm just going to talk about two different things, right? The first one, I'm definitely going to piggyback on Alf, right? Because a lot of what Alf says, right, in terms of everything he said about you thinking about the customer, I'm going to play on that and say, yeah, but you also need to think about your employees, all right? Um, and then in terms of technical, I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of a list of the, the terms, the conditions, the benefits that maybe are out there in the industry, all right, that maybe weren't in the industry 10, 20 years ago, but that people are offering now. And that if you're fighting either in, in, in com competition with other retailers out there, or if you're in a geographical town and you're fighting you know, with other businesses and other sectors in the town for the good employees of the town, you know, the type of stuff that you're maybe up against, all right? So, like, for me, all right, and again, Alf, I'm unapologetically going to piggyback on you, it, it, leadership, all right? You know, and I'm even on you, that slide on you put up where they were all on the, on the, on the stairs in their office, all right? And that, the, those, those values that Anya put up on it, all right? It's very important, okay, that as well as championing the customer and constructing your business and your offering and you guys as owners and senior managers, right? You also have to make sure, right, that you also consider your employee experience as well as your customer experience, right? So like, would you want to work for yourselves? Would you want to work for your business? If you brought yourself back to, you know, your, maybe you guys want to hire college workers or maybe you guys want to hire graduates, right? Would you want to work or you look around your town and you look around other competitors in there, right? And the sexy social media offerings that the multinationals will put on because their HR department design cool Facebook slides on come and work for us and here's what you get. Right? Where, where would you actually want to work yourselves? All right? 
And a big bugbear, I'll always challenge you on, right, is your line managers, your department heads, your supervisors, your assistant managers, your managers, all right? When you have a vacancy in that department, all right, or in that area, do you kind of end up giving the badge to the next person up? the next person who's just been there long enough, you throw an extra euro or two onto their hourly rate, all right? You're now a supervisor. Good on you. Well done, all right? Or even when you're interviewing for people, okay? Are you interviewing because of their, you know, their system knowledge or their product knowledge and all that? What about their people skills? You know, you're going to trust these people to maybe look after your, your stock, to look after your money, Okay, but you also have to make sure that you invest in them to make sure that they're good leaders. Okay, because that old statistic is still there, right? That how many people, you know, they don't leave their employer, they leave a bad manager, they leave a bad leader. Okay, um, so, so again, all right, like um, par part of why a person might leave, part of why a person might be unhappy, of course, if there's better wages down the road, if there's better offerings down the road, if there's a more flexible roster down the road, that will be a big that would be a big turnoff, all right? But it's also culture, you know? It's, 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 it's culture of customer service, but it's also just general culture. I believed Anya when she showed me that slide and she talked about integrity. She talked about being customer centric. You know what I mean? I believe that she comes in every day and is the opposite of the neg, all right? She lives and breathes that and you can see the passion in that. So she won't tolerate, right, anything different in her team. And to be fair, her team won't tolerate different said something different either. But you have to challenge yourselves. Have you got that culture in your workplace? Or is there more of you know, a hit and miss aspect to that? Alf said it, the mood of the business, the aura of the business will be dictated by the mood of the manager. If the manager simply doesn't give a you know what, how can you expect the rest of the employees? Any employee that does, or any employee, if the neg is tolerated in a business, what will the good staff do? They'll leave, they won't hang around because they won't want to tolerate in that environment, right? And then you'll be on the phone to HR, you'll be on the phone saying, God, we can't get people, we can't find people, you know? But I'm supposed, like, I can't guarantee this is a fix, but you have to try. If you don't try, you're consistently going to be caught in the cycle of, sure, look, they should be happy to work for us. Aren't, isn't it great that we'd be giving them a job, all right? And, 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 and another trick is, like, like, there's so many excellent small employers out there. I mentioned that a second ago about maybe the PR in HR, all right? That, like, I'm sure in Anya's seven Facebook posts today and all the other social media, you're probably going to see happy employees as well as happy customers in that, right? It's not all going to be Anya, look at me, I'm an award-winning business owner, I'm doing it all. You're going to see team that are happy. So if I'm interested or I'm, my daughter is coming up and lives in a certain town in Wicklow, I'm going to see, geez, that seems like a good employer. Do you know what I mean? My daughter wants to get into retail, wants to work there. I'm going to see if Anya has a job, wouldn't it be great for her to, to work there? Right? Do they know that you're good? You probably will put up Facebook posts saying, you know, two for one on steaks, two for one on shoes, great offer on a new stock, great shirts in, in store. But do you ever actually sell yourselves as an employer on your existing social media footprint? Right? Because like we all know social media kind of lasts forever and you can flick back and flick back and flick back on months and months. All right? So again, it's not even now. But it's about kind of the, the employees who might be looking for a job in a couple of months' time and know of you, you've, you've embedded in them this, geez, they seem like a good bunch. They seem like a decent, a decent workplace, okay? Um, and it's just little steps. It's little positive steps in terms of HR in all of the functions, right? It's not particularly rocket science. I get it might be hard or it might be time consuming to do, but it's not complicated to do, all right? Like recruitment and interviewing. Just make sure you put a bit of effort into your, your job specs. Just make sure that whoever is doing the interview knows how to bloom and well do an interview, right? That they've read the CVs in advance, that they know who's coming in front of them and what to ask, that they ask an element of consistency of questions. That's just two or three templates, right? That they actually will score candidates and make an informed decision rather than at the end of a long day interviewing, which one was the good one again? Was it that fella Alpha? Was that fella Tommy? I kind of forget. God, because they're all blurring into one now, right? That there's some sort of professional system for how this works, all right? Induction and onboarding, all right? Again, I'm not saying you have to send them off for five days somewhere on a meditative retreat to kind of introduce them to your company. Two hours, three hours, 
all right? Train them up in a couple of simple things. Tell them about who you are as a business. Tell them about where you've come from. Get them a bit of, bit of blood flowing about it, an excitement to be part of this story and part of this brand, right? And obviously there's things like ALF, there's things like food safety, there's things like health and safety, there's things, you know, like um, any other number of equipment or product knowledge training. Just get it organized, give it to them, right? Um, probation management, as part of an onboarding, as part of a check sheet, just make sure that after a month and two months and four months, you sit with them. Right? Build in some reminder system that after a month, even if they're absolutely sensational, still meet with them for 10 minutes and tell them that. Right? And more importantly, if they're not sensational, and if you can kind of in your waters feel something isn't quite right, there's no point in keeping that to yourself or having a whinge at home about it or, or, or talk and not telling them. Sit with them, tell them. Right? But it's the arm around the shoulder type of chat. You're doing well at X, Y, and Z, but I need you to focus on A and B, because that's who we are. That might have been tolerated in that other retailer there over there when you were with them. That's not tolerated with us. This is what we need, and this is what we expect, right? That little investment of 10 minutes for that chat makes it easier in three or four months if you're ringing the likes of me saying, oh, I, I have to get rid of them. I can't keep them on, all right? You, you can now say, well, well, do they have a contract? Yes. Do they know they're on probation? Yes. Have you given them feedback? Yes. Can you prove you gave them feedback? Yes. Fine. You know, if they're not working out, they're not working out. Sometimes it doesn't. Annual appraisal, annual reviews. How often do you actually talk to your employees? And I don't mean every day when you're on the spiral of positivity with them when they're talking about the weather or they're giving out about the commute. I say, how, do you, how much do you actually talk to them? How often do you actually sit down with them in a structured way, in a non-irate way, in a non-aggressive way, and say, here's how you're doing. In our business, we have, you know, eight kind of values, all right? We have um, tasks and we have skills, right? I'm just going to have a quick chat with you about them. Hopefully, 80 to 90% is always going to be good feedback. You're on target for that. And then you have what we call work-ons, the three or four little pet things that just, ugh, right? So rather than waiting for it to blow up, and then you end up giving out to them kind of about it, talk to them when there's no drama. Tell them, give them the feedback. Most employees want feedback. They want that communication from you because they want to get better. Right? But ultimately, once you've told them it, and once it's documented in a half an hour review, twice a year, then you've told them it, and it's recorded you told them it. So it's a legitimate expectation on your part that they'll react to it. Okay? Um, again, training and education. Right? It's kind of the light at the end of the tunnel style thing. Right? Always try to have something every year, every couple of months where you're trying to progress somebody. If you can keep them focused looking ahead, you know, a promotion, a pay rise, a bonus, uh, an Easter egg, all right, or something, some training, some development, new skills, they'll, they'll keep looking that way. They won't start looking around for another opportunity. All right? um, and obviously, okay, if you can see something in them and you want to actually invest in them from a proper education point of view rather than training, fine. You know, you can put them on some sort of a proper, maybe a management course, or I know Retail Excellence have the, have the management diploma style course. All right. Um, and so look, like ultimately, I can remember when I started, you know, as the last few slides, guys, I can remember when I started, you know, it was, it was an hourly wage. It was a, a weekly wage, maybe a bonus if you were lucky. That was it. That was what the SME sector in Ireland, small, medium sector in Ireland, and even retail did. Anything like a package of benefits or a suite of benefits was for those multinational companies or the big boys who can afford it, right? But that's trickled down now, right? And, you know, you're going to get kind of challenged as to, well, well, what else is there? What's part of the package here? So I suppose, look, it's just an eclectic mix, guys. I get the fact that some of what's on the next couple of slides, you know, it won't be relevant to all retailers, right? But at the same time, I'm telling you, in your community, in your towns, there are employers who will have aspects of this. And you guys need to challenge yourselves on, of course, what's affordable, guys, right? What's logical? And I mean, what your demographic is. If you are mainly all students, they're not going to want the same type of security or perks or, or issues that maybe a predominantly middle-aged workforce is going to have, right? He says, thinking of death and service benefit or something like that being one, okay? All right? So, obviously, I, I'm still not going to say, I mean, a competitive wage is still important. You need to have an idea as to what your competitors are offering, and you need to see what can I afford to, to, to benchmark against that, all right? Um, are there any overtime or premium rates, all right? When, when, when might there be above and beyond pay, all right, or not, all right? Um, Individual or team bonuses, all right? 
and, um, and KPI based, right? It, it was a real bugbear of my father who, who did this lark back in the 80s when it was personnel management, all right? It was a real big bugbear of him, like when did a bonus stop being a bonus? You know, when Celtic Tiger days, I'm sure it's the 1st of November again, I, I passed go, I, I, I collect my annual bonus kind of thing, all right? Definitely make it kind of, I, I, what I love in a contract is to say, your salary is gonna be this, and there's gonna be a bonus of, 500 euros, 1,000 euros available to you, all right? But every year, I'm going to meet with you and I'm going to set your tasks for that period. So you're not stuck to one particular set of, 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 uh, of bonuses, right? You can challenge somebody with a fresh target, with a fresh set of deliverables every year and challenge them to go and earn it. I mean, obviously, the spirit of this is you want to be giving it to them because if you've designed the bonus properly and cleverly, you will already have won all right, the, the whole pizza before you end up giving the employee uh, a slice of it in terms of their bonus, okay? But that's up to you guys to challenge yourselves and set that uh, bonus out properly, okay? Um, obviously, look, employee recognition schemes, you can have things like employee of the month, you can have things like, you know, um, um, the, the best salesperson of the year and they, they get some sort of special, special gift, all right? Um, again, pension. The state pension is coming in this year, but there's nothing stopping you guys for certain cohorts of people going beyond that, all right? Um, if people are going to retire now, we, you know, we all hope we're going to live to a certain ripe old age now, so no matter what time you retire at, it's, it's conceivable you're going to have quite a few years of retirement. So if you have good employees who are of a certain age, you know, a pension might be something that's very valuable to them, right? If they have a certain wage and a certain pension with you, they may not want to leave that even if it's 50 cent an hour more somewhere else because you're looking after them in that way and, and, and they will respect that. Sick pay, again, beyond statutory, right? Some of you may already do that, but if you don't, some of you may consider it. A lot of retailers I know are just not going with the 70%. They're just giving the full day's pay. They just want to do something like that kind of on top for employees, right? Believe it or not, right, retailers have, in the last couple of years, started topping up maternity pay. It just wasn't done. It was done in certain professional practices. It was not done in industries like retail and hospitality. But now retailers are finding a way. You have an excellent employee takes maternity leave, right? You know, you want to find a way to keep them part of that family. So whether it's they're going to claim Ill, uh, maternity benefit for their 26 weeks, some employers are going, I'll top it up to what your normal salary is, or I'll top up 50% um, between what's, what the maternity benefit is and what your salary is. Right? All as a means of keeping that person involved and the hope that they will come back then afterwards. All right? um, paternity pay, obviously, you could say you better not discriminate against the lads. So if you're going to design for the, for the, for the females in the 26 weeks, maybe for the two weeks that the, some, some, some fathers may, uh, may take off as well, you might do a similar thing. All right? um, annual leave, service days. Okay, so again, I know there's a cost, but the cost, it's kind of different. It's not the same as, as, as straight up wage increases. Someone's with you five years, give them an extra two days um, annual leave. Give people a paid day off on their birthday. All right, um, possibly if someone's with you 10 or 15 years, give them a one-off gift of an extra two, two weeks pay. Play around with it, whatever suits you, whatever you feel comfortable doing, but don't be shy to actually let on that this is a perk or a benefit or something that's there for working with you guys. All right, insurance products. Obviously, you can join up with a group health insurance scheme. All right, there's income protection. So while sick pay is for um, you know immediate absences of a couple of days or a couple of weeks, obviously, if one of your employees gets a really really bad knock and is in quite a bad way and might be out to fight a serious illness or recover from a serious Ill, um, illness or event, right? You can buy an insurance scheme that might not kick in for three months, but after that the insurance company pays their wage for a year maybe and then pays half their wage for a year. So you can pay a premium that provides that protection there, right, for your, 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 your team. And again, death in service benefit. It sounds morbid, right? But if, if you have people in their mid-40s, mid-50s, who have families, who have dependents, who maybe still have a mortgage, right, and they know that should the worst happen, they know that their loved ones are going to get two, three, four, five times their, their uh, salary. And that happens, they're looked after, right? Um, and, and again, someone might have a more attractive job in principle that they're trying to lure you away from, but that's a comfort blanket that you have provided for them, which will act as a pull factor uh, for your business as well, all right? Um, 
okay, remote or hybrid working, know your audience, Tommy. We, we won't kind of go there too much, I suppose, in terms of, of, of what, what, what you guys can credibly give. But again, there might be a couple of your finance team, your marketing team, your HR team, or anybody else that, look, you know, kind of, it, it, it's here now. I mean, remote working isn't going anywhere. It's, it's probably going to be the future and going to accelerate, okay? And employers just have to find ways to live with it rather than find ways to fight it. Okay, um, but again, I'm not going to dwell on it too much because I'm conscious of time as well, and I'm conscious of of, uh, of, 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 the, of the retail audience. Right? One thing that is going to be important is flexible or condensed working week. A lot of retailers, a lot of the retail excellence groups, are trialing like condensing the full time week into uh, into four days. All right? They're going like four ten hour shifts instead of five eight hour shifts. All right? Um, or concepts even of, of, of job sharing or the concepts of summer rosters or the <coughs> concepts of they're, they're playing with this because they're losing people. They're losing people because of childcare primarily, all right? And, and they want to find ways to stop losing that talent from their business. And while I get it, big businesses with big complicated HR teams, you might feel have the ability to, to, to play around with that, right? That's the competition is doing. And if, if you're scared or rigid or, or don't feel it's something you can, you, you can offer, you just got to be careful. Because again, that type of flexibility is something which is really, really important to an upcoming generations. All right. Um, so just keep an eye on it, guys, and watch for it. All right. A visible career path. You know, again, hope, you know, kind of, you know, nothing kills you like the hope, is there? All right. But that you can see we promote from within ourselves. You know, right. Kilkenny Group are excellent at this. Right? Like their, head, their head of HR for the country started off in a shop, became a manager. They put her through HR in college, and she's now kind of doing that. And, and she's one of three or four people. Uh, two of their accountants came in on work experience from their college, and they're now senior career accountants in there. All right? Kind of part of the, what Retail Excellence were focusing on as well is that like, you know, retail doesn't just have to be your college job. There are a, a vast number of careers in the wider retail space as well. All right? Just have a think about that. And if you identify good talent early, right, just don't just kind of say, oh, geez, he's brilliant. Got to be great if he stayed a while now and then walk away and go about your business. Sit down, talk to that person, the likes of the appraisal, and in the appraisal, find out, are you enjoying it here? Can you see a future here? All right? And, 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 and communicate that way. All right, um, an employee assistance program. All right, there it's an off-the-shelf product you can buy from a lot of these private healthcare, all right, uh, providers. So I know Leia do one, VHI do one. All right, um, look ultimately, what is it? It's a support that's there. It's if someone is going through a tough time, a mental health support, that you as the employer are providing an outlet for them to very confidentially. You'll never know who rang. You're not going to get a report from VHI saying Billy rang twice over over Man United. You know, Terry rang twice over financial issues, you know, and Mildred rang twice over her manager. You're never going to get that. It's completely confidential. But you as an employer can have the poster up in your canteen that we're looking out for you. If you're ever going through a tough time, we've already kind of paid up front for, and you generally get an easing as well from them on things like minding your mental health and keeping a healthy body, keeping a healthy mind, right? But again, you know, the, most of the retail groups operating in Ireland now have a pretty comprehensive EAP in place to look after, to be seen to look after their prized assets, which are their employees. All right. Um, again, final slide, guys. Okay. The good old social club is still there. There's nothing like a bit, of, a bit of bonding outside of work to actually create that bit of team spirit. All right. Um, social and charity partnerships. Again, it's about that feel good factor. It's about that bit of pride in the brand. All right. That, you know, perhaps you could let the employees choose a charity partnership for an event from a charity that's actually close to the heart of one of the employees, all right? And instead of, instead of the, the MD then stepping in and giving the big oversized check to the charity, you let the team do it, right? It adds that feel good factor, all right? I'm telling you now, all right, there's a whole generation of Greta Thunberg disciples coming up, right? Who will ask you at interview, what is your sustainability plan, all right? Um, there's a builder, builder provider spoke at this retail excellence retreat last year, all right? They're, they're, in, they're in Wicklow, okay? And like, they have solar panels on the roof, they have electric forklifts, they've bought a bigger baler because they can, because of the capacity they're baling cardboard at, they can now sell it back in to the market again and make money off of it, all right? They're moving to actually having an agreement with any supplier that the supplier is ethical, all right? Um, and they are now pretty much in that town, they are the go-to secondary school employer. All the kids from secondary school knock on their door and say, well, we've heard good things about you, we want to work for you, 
All right? So that's just the example, okay? But it's, most of you may well have taken steps along those lines, but you have to big yourself up. You have to make sure you have uh, maybe a bit of social media presence to show you're a responsible employer and you're already on the, the green plan, all right? Look, things like bike to work schemes and the tax saver initiatives, they're already there. I understand a stocked canteen, all right? But you never know, all right? Kind of, you know, if an employee doesn't have time and the milk has gone at home and it's only dry wheat a bix, kind of uh, on one of those winter mornings Alf was describing, sure, what better than to come in and there's a nice cup of coffee and, uh, and, and, uh, and Cheerios or, or, or something like that in, in the workplace for them if you have the capacity. Little things, all right? Okay, again, employee or idea of the month and certainly something that's worked well in certain employers is the idea of a referral system. If you refer a mate in who comes in, um, gets a job and passes probation, maybe there's a, you know, a, a voucher for you as one of your two gifts, not, not a third gift, we're not paying tax on it, but you know, that there's, there's maybe a gift kind of waiting, okay? Look, again, for certain employers, it works. I get it's not for everything, all right? So that's just a, a bit of an eclectic mix, guys, as to what's going on out there in terms of the, of the offerings of employers. So appreciate your patience, appreciate there wasn't too many closed eyes around the room. So thanks for bearing with me and uh, I hope you had a good evening.